intro. Welcome to Topics. Our subject today is the Burlington uh, residential real estate market. Uh, and with me are two very seasoned professionals with over almost 80 years, 80 years of experience in the Burlington residential market. Uh, they're also quite familiar faces uh, throughout all walks of Burlington life, including philanthropic business uh, and government. Uh, to my left, to my right, <laughs> left is usually my good side. <laughs> to my right is uh, Beverly Vidoli, who is the uh, owner of Remax Realty Experts. And uh, to her right is uh, Sonia Rollins, who is the sale ma sales manager at Premier, Exit Premier Real Estate. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Okay, so it's a wild market. We're, we're going to talk about that. But let's go back and talk about the dark days of COVID. Uh, were they dark? How have we recovered? Well, let's start with you, Bev. They were dark because it changed everything that we were previously doing in the market and how we practiced, how we accessed homes, how we allowed people in and out. And so we had to adjust all of that, um, some more cautiously maybe than others, but we were essential. Our business couldn't shut down. People in the middle of transactions, people had plans to move. I had one person who had already purchased a home outside of Massachusetts had to get this house sold in order to make that transition. So we weren't really able to make that shutdown that most of the businesses were. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you learned how to adjust the way you showed property. There was a lot more sanitation involved in mm -hmm. accessing homes and especially occupied homes. Mm -hmm. But we got through it. Mm -hmm. And we got through it with a market that was productive enough that it kept the trend of the business um, and sales moving forward. Hmm. So enough to make happy. a living. And enough to make a living, <laughs> um, depending on what your your goals and your abilities were. Right. Yeah. So now how about you? Did it change, for instance, was digital marketing more of a uh, an opportunity for you? Digital marketing absolutely came into play. I mm -hmm. mean, I think as the years progressed, you see that real estate has really turned. We always say our first showings happen online, right? Mm -hmm. So it matters what the digital looks like. and. I think, um, just like Beverly said, you know, the need continued. We were considered essential in the business. And of course, when COVID first hit, nobody knew who would really fall into that essential mode, mm -hmm. right? So the element of unknown scared people more than anything else. Yeah. But once they realized that, you know, as she described, there still people had a need, they had to move. And um, as dark as COVID was, sometimes you, you learn from them, right? And we learned how to do business a little bit more efficiently. And the ironic part, I think the shocking part for everybody is the market not only continued, but it thrived. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really the numbers elevated to a significant degree. And I think that was because you saw the business community learning how to work at home. All of a sudden, their current home place wasn't adequate, and they mm -hmm. had to alter that. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really like a, a, a perfect storm of we have to alter this, we have to fine tune the digital portion of it, and we have to figure out how we're gonna work at home efficiently and have children at home and teach them at home and do all of that. Right. The house became essential. And right. have people we're coming through your home while yeah. you're doing while you're all doing of that. that. Right. That was challenging. Well, you're two, we're two years out, so how would you characterize the market, Sonia? Warm, hot, scorching, what day of the week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the, the Burlington Marketplace continues to always be hot. I think mm -hmm. I'll call it hot. Scorching would probably be a stretch mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that's really just a supply and demand factor, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a seller in today's marketplace, you're still doing quite well. Um, because the lack of inventory has you know, multiple buyers going in toward homes. Pricing still matters. Um, you know, Exposure still matters. But it's not a scorching market just because people have elevated. I think everybody was worried 
you know, about interest rates rising and all of those different things happening, but really the need still exists. So when inventory is low, supply and demand kicks in, mm -hmm. the market continues to be hot. Well, talk about inventory, Bev. Well, why is inventory always so small in Burlington? Well, there's a number of factors that contribute it. To sort of piggyback on what Sonia just said, the other factor that I think is very important to keep the market moving forward is that because the interest rates did go up, we did have some challenges. You also ended up with buyers who were a little bit more demanding about what they were purchasing than previously had been the case when interest rates were so low and it was such a fireball of competitive bidding. Now, sellers have to be more um, willing to look at the condition, the location, and the type of maintenance that they've done on the house. If they want to truly get premium pricing, in most cases, and there are certain cases that would cont be contrary to this, but in most cases, you don't know when you're coming on the market how it's going to be received. So you need to think about and listen to the person who's advising you about what needs to be done to the home. Because one of the first questions is, well, what's the return on my dollar? Mm -hmm. The return on your dollar may not be monetary, directly related, but it very likely will depend on how many people can or will you're going to even look at your house. You mean it the extra money that you're going to put into the right. house to get it ready for, for that, sale? For, for the painting, for the wallpaper that you might be on, having on the house, or updating a bathroom or a kitchen that you don't want to do because you're leaving. Mm -hmm. But that's going to have a return, whether it's dollar for dollar or more likely plus, because it's going to get more people into the home and it's going to look more attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important in today's market. The inventory factor has another issue related to it. We can't. We're all, we ca we came off the heels of such low interest rates. Two point five, two point seven five. I have one or two people that got in the high ones, mm -hmm. and they are not moving right. for hell or high water. Right. <laughs> that's that's right. just their position right, right now. So their choices are: keep the house and use it as a rental, sell it to a family member, but they're still going to lose their rate. But at least they'll have you know, a value there for themselves, but more likely, they're going to put an addition on or mm -hmm. try to do that. That's, that's the frustrating part right now because to get a contractor within a timely period of... Uh, that well, you're hold that thought because we're going to go into that very subject okay. for just, just a moment. Uh, Sonia, what about uh, some of the horror stories, <coughs> excuse me, for a buyer uh, about these uh, <coughs> bidding wars and... Uh, over market, uh, over asking bids that went on in the last year or two. Has that yeah. been true? Oh, it was very true. Mm. I mean, it was, um, there would be sometimes where it would be almost shocking, right? Mm. Whether you were on the listing side or the buying side, um, the numbers were shocking at times because, you know, we can tell you that we can sit there and tell you what comparatively this house should sell at based on recent solds. And then emotion kicks in. And when emotion kicks in, logic goes out the window. When you're a buyer who's done 12, 13, 15 offers by the 16th, you're that person who's going 100 mm -hmm. over asking just because you want to get there. Mm -hmm. When the interest rates were lower, um, that was easier to do. Their buying power was, was stronger. So that part, you know, for them it was a horror and a joy because when they finally hit, I mean, I, I'm sure Beverly would say the same thing. There were tears. There were mm -hmm. tears when you'd have to call them to say they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And there were tears when, you know, how do you have an offer that's 100000 over the asking price and you don't get it? It's, it's hard to hear. Mm -hmm. So that was really the trying part, is they were doing everything they had, but so were 24 other people at the same time. I think that's leveled out, Phil. Mm -hmm. I think there's certainly still over asking that's market. happening, but it's, but it's leveled itself out a bit. Part of that is from buying power. Part of that is from you know, they've, they've taken a step back and are taking a breath. Okay, in the industry, you've at one time or another represented both sides of the coin. So, Sonia, why don't you start with the buyer? What are you telling the buyer when they come here? Uh, what features are you proposing uh, that would uh, make them want to live in Burlington? There's so many and great then, things. And then, <laughs> Bev, you can do the flip side for the seller. How are we going to pump this up? How are we going to value it appropriately? How are we going to bring your expectations in line? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sonia. Burlington, um, you know, we always say Burlington's a great place to work, live, and play, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that is very true. 
Um, you know, when we talk to buyers about Burlington, we talk about the amenities that you have around you. You know, you're almost sitting in a little area where you can get the top restaurants around you, you have shopping around you, you have a school district that does well, you have access to 95, 93. To the Northern you know, Kingdoms, yeah, you to know, Boston. You can, you can really get yourself everywhere. <laughs> the other beautiful part that I think sometimes people don't think about because they're so fine-tuned on a property is what amenities does the municipality serve for you and what is the, is that within your tax dollar or not mm -hmm. when you can start educating a buyer that if you choose Burlington you're going to choose a community who doesn't have a trash fee doesn't have a fee for their for their schooling if they have kids who play sports, sports. it's inclusive in their tax dollar mm -hmm. and when they start shopping around community to community dollar for dollar Burlington's giving you mm -hmm. Now, from the seller standpoint, how do you bring them into the, the realm of uh, realism. reality? Well, a lot of that has to do with how are you going to set your property aside because we already know that Burlington's in high demand, that the school system has a much more attractiveness um, to the families than it was before. They've been working on, on that aspect of it. And people are comparing the amenities, all that were just you know, stated by, by um, um, Sonia. But the fact is, your property and the buyers that are going to be looking at it are, are, have to be matched. The buyers aren't free for all, bidding recklessly. I know that in the last six months, we've sold 75, 79 homes in Burlington. And of, that, of those 79, only 20% have actually had at asking or over asking which mm -hmm. is surprising because people think everything's going over asking. Mm -hmm. But it depends on, as I said earlier, the location that you have, the, the condition of the house, and what have you done for updates? What is the, the buyers are now looking a little bit more carefully at what additional money they're going to have to invest. And, even, and if it is one of the premier properties that's, that's getting a lot of att attention, the 16, 17, 20 uh, offers that people used to make, on one single property or on multiple properties and the 20 something offers that would come in on it is not as frequent today yes. but there's multiple bids mm -hmm. there might be anywhere from three to six to seven offers that's still more than one mm -hmm. more than yours so you have to be creative as a seller to draw that that interest in so that you will get a more competitive bidding and know where your house is going to likely fall mm -hmm. because before we couldn't even predict right. where it was going to go now we can look at that and the seller has to be realistic about what they're offering to the public. What analysis are you using? Are you using Zillow, the assessed value, comps? You know, when a buyer, when a seller mm -hmm. says, I want to move my house, they yeah. want to talk to you about price. They have no idea. They know what happened on their street. They really don't know how to analyze the marketplace. Two cookie cutter homes next to each other are not identical mm -hmm. because of especially if they're not brand new but even brand new there's different amenities put in to a lot of these homes features that might be in one but not the other but when you're looking at the assessed values it it doesn't work if you're looking at Zillow it gives you a window but it's not a true window because you don't know what's in the house mm -hmm. they don't know exactly how or what condition it's in so you have to be really um, knowledgeable about what has sold in town and as a broker as an agent um, to know what you're advising the seller and what that competition and the basis for buyers valuations are going to be so when a seller is deciding to put their house on the market we really depend on what we have for actual comparable sales mm -hmm. the bank appraisers are going to use the exact same information mm -hmm. they're not going to use assessment uh, first off, they're not going to use Zillow or any of the other means of doing evaluations. They're going to look at what's in MLS for actual recorded deeded sales. Mm -hmm. And they'll look at off-market sales, uh, which means they didn't make it to MLS, and they'll look at the on-market. But generally, it's more on-markets mm -hmm. that are used and available. When you arrive at a price, Sonia, how long does it have to be on the market before it's time for the buyer to adjust their, uh, the seller? to adjust their expectations? You know, that's a discussion um, everybody should be having with their sellers when they first start. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that we basically know within a week what's mm -hmm. going on, right? So fly. you right. can tell that first impulse and the first, and I think,
really said two houses sitting side by side could be completely different. The, the, the secret to it, though, is that you have to set that expectation up front with your client saying, you know, first of all, you're not in the same multiple bid situation. What something sold for a year ago or two years ago does not constitute that it's going to be higher than that. And what your asking price is, you better be prepared to actually accept if someone hands you, right? Because in their minds, sometimes they're saying, mm -hmm. well, this is going to be where we're starting. Um, I always say to people, if you're 30 days in and you haven't seen something, th there's something to talk about. Now, depending on that seller's need, that could be two weeks from then or it could be 30 days from then. But the market um, doesn't get better, as a house said. The, you know, the market is well aware of what the value is. Like, given how much consumers can get online now, given that they have access to public record as anybody else does on what everything has sold around them, they're actually a very educated buyer at this point. They're, they're, they're relying on us to, to give them some advice and to be able to point out things along the process, but a lot of them actually really know and it's incumbent on us to kind of share that information with the seller and kind of have, a, um, based on their needs, have a plan going forward if in fact two weeks later you're standing or a month later you're still standing. For brokers, um, for, uh, for your industry, is, is there still exclusive, exclusivity as an agent or is it all MLS now where you're sharing all this information, sharing all the open houses? It's, it, it, to get into MLS you have to have an exclusive agreement with, with the seller. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have the option of putting something in that's um, generally not exclusive. Now it could be exclusive on a number of different terms but there has to be a contractual agreement. Mm -hmm. So when you're s discussing with your agent what you're going to do you need to really be careful about understanding what your timeline is, the seller's timeline needs to be, what their goals are because that sets a course of decision making on how you're going to approach the pricing, how you're going to approach the time on the market the average days on the market right now are actually for the last six months about 44 days total. Really? But mm -hmm. in that 44 days, the, this, I'm talking average, mm -hmm. and then in that 44 um, day period, the days to an offer might be 30, 28, 29, 30 days in that period. But it takes a period to get it ramped up from when it's initially signed. It gets a peer. It has a period of when you go from offer to purchase and sale agreement. And so those dates can vary. Now, under a million, those dates greatly change. Mm -hmm. When you're over a million now, then the dates, you know, are a little bit more aggressively longer. How about financing, Sonia? We go back, you both were in the 2009 market where mm -hmm. we had complete financial meltdown, we mm -hmm. had mortgage-backed securities, we had financing that was 5-1 uh, arms with a second on top both adjustable, suddenly everything went south and then yes. we're closing. What are you seeing in the industry now in terms of financing? Who's doing good financing in the Burlington marketplace and can they be relied upon? Yeah, I think that um, I think that the banking industry and the financing industry in general has obviously, no secret, tightened up mm -hmm. on that a lot, right? There are there are both local banks and mortgage companies who offer a lot of different competitive style financing. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of different financing hasn't changed, Phil. I mean, where people's buying power has changed because the interest rate went up, and adjustable still lives for people. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're not giving them as readily because you really have to you really have to qualify for an adjustable at a higher rate, right? Mm -hmm. Because if it adjusts, you have to still be able to qualify for those well, numbers. When I say conventional, are we talking about, you know, People are buying eight, nine hundred, one point two million dollar homes in Burlington. That yeah. Do they require twenty percent down? The, uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're obviously stronger buyers if they're putting twenty percent down. But, but there are still, you know, there's still very many people who are coming to the table holding high notes and putting five percent down, ten percent down. You know, really? if they can qualify, if their debt to income qualifies, um, then then they can still do that. Now, on the listing side. If you see a buyer that has one portion and another buyer who's putting down more, I mean, clearly on a financing issue, the stronger buyer has more money. Um, but, but sometimes when you're talking about the numbers we're talking about, it's hard to have 20% mm -hmm. uh, of those numbers. And if they qualify just on what they're making and their credit score holds them, you know, there's still ample opportunity to finance and there's still 
you know, plenty of banks in the area that well, will do it. Well, back 50 years ago, you, <coughs> you two are youngsters, but back 50 years ago, uh, you couldn't possibly own a home in this region if you didn't have 20% down. Right, and that is so not well, the case. Well, the other part of it, too, was there was a period of time where the lenders were offering programs that allowed you to make up the 20% with a second mortgage on yeah. the property that mm -hmm. you were purchasing. That was a widely used program. That went away, um, but, it's, but it's back mm -hmm. in, in a modified fashion, but not to the degree that it was at before and only limited at certain lenders. But for people who are well qualified, these buyers are younger. When I was in my 20s, I wasn't thinking about buying a home until I was almost in my 30s. <laughs> so, that's unusually mm -hmm. young, uh, and today they start right in high school yeah. and, and college thinking about home buying. Mm -hmm. But the other part of it is there are a lot of these buyers who really don't think they're ever going to buy. They are not interested in it the way home ownership, especially when you went to different stages of your life. Mm -hmm. they're very, some are very happy in rental situations. Mm -hmm. Others are, are a little dismayed about the opportunities that they have available to them to even enter that market in the near future. And near future it might be like five years. Mm. Now I have a theme <coughs> since I've been here for a long time uh, and s have seen a lot of these houses go up back in the 50s and 60s. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. to admit. <laughs> uh, do an analysis for us, both of you, on what the, what the line is for knockdown. Uh, my I think we'll probably is, both agree on that one. <laughs> <laughs> my theme is that uh, anything in Burlington that's pre-1970 that is unimproved is a knockdown, potentially. What do you think? I think that's, that's a reasonable uh, time period, but I think it's really the 50s and 60s that are really being um, hard to maintain. If, have they have, if they have not been maintained, especially if there's elderly or senior long-term owners there that have just gotten to the point where they can't maintain it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's always easier to have someone come to the door with cash, close in 30 days, forget the inspection, it's a clean deal, and the, and the threshold of that number can be as low still, not many, but there's been a couple that are still in the 500s. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, we're talking 600s 600. for for something that's going to be leveled right. and and a, you know a, a much larger home built there because when they're paying that kind of money to take down a home you put up a big and you're building something you have to build something that's going to build in the profit because you hear so many complaints from people about those big homes being um, taken over in neighborhoods uh, in certain areas and it's hard because the logically there's no way somebody can pay if there's th multiple offers that they can, that a seller should want to take someone who has to put them through a financing period, a home inspection period. So unfortunately, that's been the winning ace in the hole for a lot of people. Right. Now let's talk about, you had mentioned it earlier about the accessory apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the process, Sonia, for getting an accessory apartment? And secondar secondarily for both of you, um, would it slow the Min McMansion effect if we allowed accessory apartments for everybody by right with only building inspector approval? Wouldn't that enable seniors to maybe, or even just regular parents who have 20 or 30 year olds to allow their, uh, mm -hmm. their uh, not siblings, their children to, uh, to live in the accessory or move into the big one? I mean. Why aren't we doing that? And what is the process first? Well, right now, the, access, the, the zoning bylaw has a very definitive definition for accessory apartments, and the house has to be built within a certain amount of, prior to a certain year. The square footage percentage on an accessory has to be only, I believe it's less than 30% of the entire square footage of the home. It's a very tight guideline where an accessory apartment would be allowed. Now, in-laws are different, obviously, than accessory apartments. Accessory apartments, by zoning right, allow for you to rent them mm -hmm. to a stranger, mm -hmm. right, to someone who's not within your family. An in-law apartment, which is more readily available, you can, you can build on, to, if, if you have the dimensional requirements you need, mm -hmm. the building department can approve those. Um, do I think people should, should open up the accessory apartment more? Absolutely. I, um, 
I think the bylaw, when it was written, has some definition that it would look like a single family dwelling from the outside. I think that's perfectly fine. I understand we're trying to keep the look of a neighborhood, of course, right? But it, it piggybacks really on the teardown philosophy mm -hmm. because, um, as Beverly said, these people sometimes are staying in their house and they're not able to maintain them. Mm -hmm. And um, this speaks very much to the housing stock in Burlington needs to be more diversified. Mm -hmm. So for people who have been here a long time, they really do feel like there's a lot of condos or a lot of apartments or a lot of townhouses. But really, when you look at the demographic, there really isn't enough because if someone is staying in their house longer than they should, they're not maintaining it more, as opposed to being able to have an option to either build an accessory, build an in-law, or um, move to multifamily housing. You know, mm -hmm. if they can move to multifamily housing, they can now, now their house may not be a teardown because they've, they've gotten out of it before they've gotten to the point where it's not able to be um, maintained. But wouldn't it be easier <coughs> for el an elderly person or somebody who can't keep up with the maintenance because of their on a fixed yes. income, if they were simply allowed by right to put a, a rental attached to their unit? Yes. Well, y one, of the, one of the factors there that's interesting is that the accessory, as she explained it, is exactly what's been on, on the bylaw and I've been dealing with them for to say it over 40 years and and that creates rental income for the homeowner mm -hmm. but when you have people who want to get a stake in real estate they're not able to come into Burlington as you, as our children would want to do and and be able to purchase here if that was their desire because of the cost factors mm -hmm. but the what's interesting is what's happening in the area um, Bedford about two years ago started a um, study and they started with Baker's plan and ended up uh, now just passing and they're in the process of it being developed but they actually allow accessory by right and you can do a separate um, detached property on your property. A detached? A detached property and I had a situation years ago where a, um, uh, a single mom had a, wanted to subdivide her 20,000 square foot lot and was turned down several times. I think it would be great for the for the boards to kind of come in line with what the needs are and and the cost and the process that people have to go through to be able to use the space they have. We don't want to make it a very dense community. That's always been a concern for people. But if you want to put, as Sonia said, more variety in housing stock, if you have a, um, a, a ability to be able, the other thing Bedford did, was you can on any and now it's of right throughout the town that you can take um, your lot and put a two-family structure on it without zoning restriction, mm -hmm. and that allows people home ownership. It allows people to have family members be a, be adjacent to them and and has more freedom of size mm -hmm. in terms of the mag 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 mansions of the we path. You talked about a hole in the housing stock. Let's talk about condos. Um, condominiums, one bedroom condominiums, for instance, would be a perfect entry point for our own children or, you know, uh, uh, people who have children of that age who might be living at home at 20, 25 years old or whatever. Yeah. Uh, single uh, bedroom condos would be a perfect way to enter the Burlington market at sub 600, sub maybe even 500. I mean, Bob Murray did it on uh, on the town center plan. He did. Uh, he did it across the street from uh, um, the old Dale Pharmacy, which I'm dating yes, myself. We all know <laughs> to at the table. It's but fine. those aren't one bedrooms either. There are some in some of the buildings, but yes. they're not. They weren't designed to be a one bedroom entry. They were more designed to be a trade down from downsizing. Downsizing, downsizing but they right. were still at the time under three hundred thousand dollars. Now it's a few years back probably a decade, maybe a more. Well, it's 11, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. imagine. It's I scary, know. but there it lives, scary. yeah. <laughs> but they started at 350. Yeah. yeah. They actually started almost at 360. Really? But they were, that was a two bedroom. The one bedrooms were a little bit less. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it was a great downsize opportunity and a lot of Burlington people took advantage of it. And even though there was controversy in the beginning, but I think the biggest problem with what your, and your idea would be wonderful because that idea of the work, um, you know, that first work kind of one bedroom studio or apartment setup would be great, but there's no incentive with the tax code right now 
from what I understand, because I've looked into it. Income tax code. Yeah. This. Yeah, because it's ordinary income if right. you sell it within a year, 38% versus, right. okay, capital And for gains. the developers to do right. it, because the, right. because the cost of the land and the availability of the land is still high and weak, right. and, and you've also got the um, investment and cost of the build-out right. to have that transition. And then so, go back for an additional 20% right. over the... I so it. So it really isn't mm -hmm. as easily done and we've we're at our uh, 40b threshold so we're, we're not in there's no danger here for us to do that so if we start looking at a different way of getting accessory apartments which answers a rental factor and then maybe look at what some of the other options are because we have a lot of vacant commercial property here right. and that vacant commercial property is going to begin to drain into our other support cash systems flows. and cash flows right. that the residents enjoy right now. So I, before it gets to a level of real red flag danger, we should be looking at the off right of, of what Bedford did, for instance. Right. Lexington has their own property. Pro well, could uh, we program. give, say for instance, one of these big, uh, as these leases roll off, we know that at-home work is, is affecting uh, occupancy. Uh, as these leases roll off and somebody wants to convert one of these big buildings to a uh, to condominiums or to rental apartments, yeah. um, could we pass legislation to allow it? I gotta wrap up, this is the last question. Oh. Unfortunately, time flies oh. when you're having fun. Uh, could we pass legislation locally so that they don't get that zoning unless they make condos? Because what drives me crazy is they put up a $100 million project of rentals, it appreciates 7% a year, they get the rental income, and it all goes to the developer, and the you know the community, the member of the community doesn't profit. Go ahead, and then we got to close. Always be, it. you know, uh, there there are always great incentives both within the municipality and within the Commonwealth that would allow for those incentives to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Fair Housing says you can't really do a, a rental versus a, a condominium for sale. But there are incentives to get to get projects done where people. It really depends on what the cost factor is, right? Mm -hmm. Of what they're going to do to to turn it around. And in my opinion, I think that it's it. We won't even touch this piece, but the MBTA whole uh, category. We didn't get to that. We class. didn't get to it, but it's okay. But the the truth is. I know a lot of people are frustrated because they're saying, the Commonwealth is saying you have to put the zoning in, but it is the way people are living. And you don't have to use the zoning. You have the right. last word. Okay. Yes. Um, I think that the real important thing right now is that we keep the balance, the balance of the type of housing that we can offer. Right now, we're very weak on the low end, lower end, entry ent ent entry level housing that we need for the, the starting workers, yeah. um, the, the people who go up here. The Anyone, here. right, yeah. and so condominium um, building would be a big advantage if, if we can keep those numbers down on the cost factors of those units down. But again, it comes into what's the tax incentive for them to do it, what's the zoning incentive for them to do it, and if they can do it, then let's, open up our zoning to an of right in certain areas so we're not going through this long process. Okay, my director is directing me and he's <laughs> directing me that we've run out of time. I'd like to thank our guests today, Beverly Badoli and Sonia Rollins. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay.